you may think of global warming as a story of centuries. You know, our great grandparents started burning coal in England or whatever, and we're going to have to clean up the mess so that our great grandchildren don't have to deal with the consequences. But half of all of the damage that we've done to the planet's climate through the burning of fossil fuel has come in the last 25 years. A quarter of the damage has come since 2008, when Joe Biden was elected vice president on a ticket headlined by Barack Obama, who accepted the Democratic nomination and announced that that would be the moment that we looked back on when the rising of the seas began to slow and the planet began to heal. And though we think of carbon dioxide as a gas which dissipates, we actually know that that's not how it works. <laughs> Once in the atmosphere, it hangs there, um, typically for centuries, if not millennia, making it effectively permanent, which has some interesting impacts on the way that we think about time and historical responsibility, since the burning of a piece of coal today in China is doing equivalent damage to the burning of a piece of coal in Newcastle in the 19th century or Pittsburgh in the 20th century. And that means that while we often conceptualize the climate challenge by thinking about the future and what must be done, we all should also think about our history and what we've already done. And by that measure, by the way, the US is by far the world's worst emitter and will never be caught by China or anyone else. We also know the scale of that damage that's been done. Literally, we can measure it by weight and all that stuff that's hanging permanently in the atmosphere weighs more than everything that humans have ever built on the surface of the Earth. It also weighs more than every living thing on planet Earth. So in this way, we've built a larger and more permanent monument to human civilization in the atmosphere than we ever managed on the planet itself. And we have reshaped that atmosphere more through the burning of fossil fuels than this planet has been reshaped by life. We also know what we need to do, which is to say decarbonize everything. Not just our power sector, not just our cars, but our airplanes, also our in heavy industry, um, our agriculture, our infrastructure. Absolutely every feature of modern life has a large carbon footprint. And if we wanna stop warming, it means eliminating all of that carbon. This has recently been called a World War II scale mobilization, and more recently, um, a green industrial revolution. It is that, but I also think it's important to remember that it's also a kind of deindustrialization, because electricity is much more efficient than the burning of fossil fuel. Simply electrifying our power systems would mean that we would need only half as much energy as we have as we use today, maybe less. Land land use for all global renewables. Um, is smaller than is currently used by the world's oil and gas infrastructure, which means that making that trade would actually require less land rather than more. And while there's been a lot of talk recently about the mining needs to produce um, a renewable revolution, mining sufficiently to totally power all of the world's energy needs indefinitely into the future would only be one one hundredth as land intensive as today's extraction of oil and gas. So if we go from dirty energy to clean, we actually cut our mining footprint by a factor of 100. Last year, in early spring, there was an unprecedented heat wave that swept South Asia and the Middle East, in particular across India and Pakistan. And when scientists talk about mortality risk from heat, they talk about what's called a wet bulb temperature, which is a mix of heat and humidity. So if it's really hot, it can be pretty dry and you're pretty safe. And if it's wet, it can, doesn't have to be that hot for it to be really risky to your health. And studies have shown that um, there's a kind of what they call a maximum survivable limit of wet bulb temperature. And if it gets to that point, people simply won't be able to cool off, especially if they're being active, even if they're young and healthy. During this heat wave in India and Pakistan, there were a number of places where the maximum survivable wet bulb temperature was reached or quite closely approached. Only for a few hours, but nevertheless, right there. Some of them were cities of hundreds of thousands of people, other places more rural areas. But across India and Pakistan, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people subjected to heat quite close to some of these limits. And people did die, but not 100 million people, not 500,000 people, probably not even 100,000 people. The data is a little complicated. India doesn't do great in measuring deaths there, and we should almost certainly you know, adjust our estimates significantly upward from their official tallies. But in fact, more people died this summer in Europe, 60,000 from heat than died last spring in India, even though the, the temperature, the wet bulb temperature was so much higher there. And in fact, that's been the pattern over the past generation, that the deadliest heat events are not in the global south, are not in developing countries, are not in the hottest parts of the world. The deadliest heat event, events have all been in the global north, in places where people were not used to heat at all. Many of them don't have 
air conditioning. They have buildings that were built to retain heat rather than distribute it and cool it. Um, and I think this is a very powerful case study and lesson into the complexities and nuances of these climate threats. We can you know, paint a map red with heat risk, um, but ultimately all of us are going to be navigating that landscape of risk as humans, as individuals, as political actors, through societies, through communities, through built environments. And all of these make the actual outcomes much, much harder to see, much harder to see clearly. So, I mean, I think that heat is going to be a real problem for South Asia. I don't want to dis dismiss, or, dismiss or diminish that. Um, but I also don't think it's safe to say, as many people have, unfortunately, over the last few decades, oh, it's the equatorial bands of the planet that are going to really get screwed here. Everybody else is going to be fine. We have a lot of work to do, even in the richest parts of the world, to protect our most vulnerable people. Or think of the, the fires that swept across Canada this, this summer. They tripled the previous record for area burn six times as much land burned as in the recent average, and 70 times as much as in a recent calm year. Half of the world's countries can fit inside the area that was burned inside of Canada this year. And if you take two thirds of the world's countries, take all of their carbon footprints and add them up, they add up to less than the carbon released by the fires in Canada this year. So Canada's carbon emissions are greater than 160 countries. Total, not individual, total. Many climate scientists have told me they don't even know how to incorporate this season into their historical averages because it's such an outlier that it distorts the trend line so much, they may want to just leave it out. That's how much of a surprise this year has been. There are also big questions about how to think about these um, sort of pure matters of climate science. There's like how it interfaces with our built environment and our societies, but it's also just the things we know and how we contextualize the climate events themselves. How do we make sense of data that tells us that sea ice anomalies, for instance, are a one in five sigma or six sigma or seven sigma event. What does it mean if we're witnessing a once in a billion year event on this planet? Statistical analysis here fails us almost as surely as language does. Even if the anomaly qualifies as only a one in a million, what does it mean to be living in a one in a million planet? And where does the branching of chance go from there? How do we plan around those things? As I hope these examples show, there are uncertainties at almost every level. There are uncertainties about the climate system. One recent debate is about what's called climate sensitivity. So if we double CO2, how much warming do we get? Conventional analysis suggests three degrees, but the uncertainty range includes warming up to four and a half degrees. So even if we do quite a good job at decarbonizing, we could get unlucky on that front and end up on a warmer planet. We have uncertainties about the human response in terms of mitigation, even simply assessing current policies um, we have some assessments from places like the International Energy Agency, which suggests that we are almost on track for net zero by 2050. And others like the American Energy Information Agency, which say that fossil fuel emissions won't even decline at all by 2050. And both of those are thoughtfully built models. Personally, I'm more on the IEA side than the American EIA side, but, so I think we're going to do better rather than worse. But you know, these are not things that we know for sure. We also have uncertainties about adaptation, a lot of them which I think this is a, a, a big part of the story to emerge, is that adaptation will be as large uh, a contributor and a factor in, in our futures than um, as, as the climate impacts themselves. It's tempting to think that motivated in part by knowledge and in part by fear, we can take action to protect one another. But across the world, people are moving toward the risk of flooding, not away from it. Or look at Lahaina in Maui, where a complex stew of factors created what is the deadliest American wildfire in a full century, and only the latest example of what some climate scientists describe as the return of the urban firestorm, which is to say fires that wildfires that are not proceeding tree to tree, but house to house, in part because of how those houses were built, how that housing zoning was developed, how the housing codes were developed, which is to say it is making our development choices the fuel. And this was, until recently, almost unheard of. I mean, we talked about the Great Chicago Fire. We talked about the Great London Fire. Those were in different eras. When a small town in northern Canada called Slave Lake burned in 2011, it felt like it was a new era. Then a much bigger town, Fort McMurray, burned in 2016. And it was, oh, we've seen another example of this. And it was a, a big industrial city. It wasn't just a tiny little hamlet in the woods. But even then, people didn't really think of it as um, something we were going to be seeing nearly as regularly as we have. It's happened since in Santa Rosa and in Paradise, California. It's happened in Boulder and Lytton in, in British Columbia. 
and enterprise in Canada, to name just a few. In Kelowna, in British, Colum in, uh, British Columbia this year, wildfires jumped two miles across Lake Okanagan. The embers were the size of fists, and they were giving off so much heat that they were picked up by NASA satellites. If you just think about what kind of protection is necessary to protect yourself from a wildfire, if a two-mile lake is insufficient, 